Robert Zykowski. Welcome to our session on decision making in fast paced sport. Uh, this all kind of started a few years back. Some of you might be familiar with a couple of books that I, I wrote here on the uh, Playmaker's Advantage, where I, with my good colleague Dan Peterson, talked a great deal about uh, uh, decision making in fast paced sports and how we train that. Uh, I had an Aussie version of the book, which one I just showed you, it has a cricket ball rather than baseball. This is the, the North American version. Uh, and then we followed it up with the playmaker's decisions on the science of uh, clutch plays and mental mistakes and so forth. And uh, what happened uh, after the publication of the book is that uh, I met people like Kevin McGraskin, who's going to be batting lead off for us today. And he published this book, a wonderful book on scanning. Uh, Kevin is a distinguished uh, coach in the world of soccer football from Scotland. You'll find that out sooner than that as you listen to him speak. But he, Kevin's been all over the world coaching and spreading uh, the word, if you will, on this relatively new technique of scanning to improve decision making. And, and I'll let him talk about that. So Kevin's going to be our first speaker. and. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more because he knows this field so well. Uh, and uh, I'll just turn things over to Kevin. Away you go. Thanks, Len. Um, really appreciate that. I am going to uh, uh, sh do a, a short presentation here and I'll just uh, share my screen. So we'll get into a little PowerPoint presentation to talk through some of my thoughts on decision making uh, in fast paced sports. Uh, where I concentrate a lot of my thoughts is actually in the bit before the decision making um, because I feel that that gets overlooked somewhat and uh, is certainly underdeveloped. Um, and myself, I've, I've done a lot of coach education in the in the soccer world with us. Uh, worked a lot with the Irish FA on delivering on their UEFA Pro Licence, A Licence and B Licence courses on this topic. Uh, also worked with the Croatian FA on their UEFA Pro Licence and A Licence courses. So I've been very fortunate to, to be around and I've worked at the professional level in both the men's and the women's games. Uh, and implemented this in a practical way uh, on the, the training pitch to, to work with the players. And as Len mentioned, uh, I then decided to put my, my thoughts together in a book to, to put my ideas out there. Uh, one thing I always like to caveat is I never claim that the way I do things is the way, but it's it's a way of, of developing and training these skills in the game. Um, so first things first, when we, when we look at decision making uh, this is a uh, pep guardiola you know one of the all-time great coaches and one of the things he says is taking the right decision in the right moment that's the most difficult thing in football and and it is uh, the, the game is hugely complex but you could apply that principle to any fast-paced uh, sport and so the things i'll talk about today while i i'll, I'll talk kind of soccer specific this applies to all the fast-paced sports out there and myself i've actually done some work with field hockey teams and rugby teams as well so those that are invasion type games you know basketball ice hockey even uh, american football to, to a certain degree all of these principles will kind of apply and hopefully coaches from those sports or people working in those sports will be able to take a couple of nuggets out of what i talk about today and see how it applies in theirs um, the first thing that I like to talk about when we think about decision making is looking at a very basic linear model of decision making because this is how a lot of people consider it. You know, see, think, do. You know, players uh, look, then they make a decision based on what they see, then they commit to an action. Um, so, very basic, fundamental decision making uh, process there. However, what you find is, and when we talk about soccer, is that what happens is that players control the ball. Then they look, then they make their decision, then they make their action. And when we think about fast-paced sports, that's far too slow. It's in the wrong order. They've really got to have looked, assessed the playing area before even receiving the ball um, in order to have that picture in their head and the decision-making process already started in their heads, if maybe not fully completed. Um, 
But here's what <laughs> soccer players really tend to do. They focus on the ball. They watch that moving around the playing area as opposed to while the ball is moving and while they're away from the ball, using that opportunity to scan, to assess where is the ball, where is the teammates, where are the opponents, where is the space, because that's what influences what they then need to do in the game. So they should be scanning around, taking in that information. So they've started formulating their decision and their options before they've even received the ball. So that once that they're, they're receiving the ball and it's the ball's on its way to them, they can have one last look to maybe confirm um, and one last look to assess. And they know what their decision could be then. Now, they might then need to subsequently change that decision because of what opponents do and the pressure that they apply. But they've already got an idea of what they're going to do with the ball before they get it. And then they could commit to the action. And that's what the best players in the world do. They, they scan continuously at a very high rate around the field to assess what's going on. So they formulate those decisions in their brain before they've even received the ball. And I'm talking a lot about when players receive the ball. Bear in mind that any action that a player does on the field requires a decision at one level or another. It might be a very explicit decision or it might be a very at a very subconscious level. Um, but they'll make decisions all the time throughout the game. However, I, I don't like to, to think that as a, a, a linear process. Um, I call it see, think, play, but I, I, it's not a linear process. It's very much a, a cycle, a, a cycle, a decision cycle that where the elements influence and interact with each other. Okay, and again, there's various models uh, there. Len put a, a, a fabulous model, the, the athletes. Uh, decision model together in in, in his books. Um, that there's other Gary Klein does a lot of great work out there as well. Um, so there's lo lots of places you can look at for decision making models. But this is how I like to to think of it in in soccer. These elements they're not separate. They're not linear. It's not one after the other. They're continually interacting with each other. And I put here again as a a model together just to simplify things, to make my understanding clearer and, and hopefully when I share my ideas, people can see what it is that I'm talking about. So uh, there between the look and uh, the, the see and the think, um, again, th there's a multitude of things, but three simple things that we could say that impact on decisions are signals, situations and scenarios. Signals are put Advanced cue utilisation, so the postural cues that you see from the other players around you. You'll read them to interpret what you think they're intending to do next. Situations are where a player will put their eyes on a, a situation in the field of play and kind of pattern match that to get a feel for what's going to happen next because they've experienced those kind of situations before. So it's a bit of pattern recognition there. Scenarios is kind of from the other end where it's like it's a tactical play that the team have worked on. Um, and they've set up certain scenarios that where the players could recognise the, the the cues that are in there to know what they're going to play together. So the scenarios are, it's more, instead of the players receiving the signals and making sense, they're actively looking for these cues to perform in a cohesive way with their teammates. Uh, framing uh, tactical tendencies and technical. So the tactical frames that the coach puts in place of how they ask the team to play will frame the kind of decisions that the players are going to make about the actions that they're going to choose because it's now constrained within the framework of that tactical guidance that the coach has offered. Tendencies, these are what players kind of like to do. It's not limited by their technical component in any kind of way, but it's the kind of things that they like to do. But And individuals and teams can have tendencies. So that informs you when you know what the tendencies are for yourself, that's the way you're likely going to go. But when you can read, understand the opponent's tendencies, you, you get a better insight to what they are maybe likely to do in any given situation. The technical component really is the technical repertoire you've got is going to limit what you're going to decide to do. So if, if you haven't got a 60-yard pass in your locker, you, you're, you're never going to think about actually trying to play a 60-yard pass. You're, you've got a 40-yard radius, you're going to think about those options and decisions within that 40 yard radius. And uh, the, the, the bit between the, the, the scene and the play uh, is very important as well. And the first thing um, that I talk about here is prospecting. 
You know, like the you know people going out looking for gold, looking for valuable material, valuable information. Is how do you carry yourself on the field to play as you're walking about when you, or running about, or moving about at varying speeds in order to gather in information? And players often don't have a good body body orientation. They don't have a good position on the field. And they don't move their head and eyes often enough to gather in information and they tend to follow the ball with their eyes far too much. Um, perspective is that, that again, kind of like technical component, but when the player is looking around for opportunities to act in the field of play, they see it through the lens of their own capabilities. So it's not like the nest. What I'm capable of doing, I'll look at a picture and I'll see options to do one thing. Thierry Henry, who is an excellent player, or Dennis Bergkamp, they look at the same picture. They see a whole other range of possibilities because their technical components far higher. So they're actually seeing the opportunities ha available to them in front of their eyes. And priming is really it's the situation itself just primes it. And I get that this is kind of... A decision is maybe getting made even here, but it's one of those at such a subconscious level that the situation arises and the player acts almost instinctively. Okay, it's not instinctively, it's more intuitively, you know, if we want to get into the semantics of those words. But they, they've, they've got a feel for what's happening. They've got a feel for kind of what they can do and they try and problem solve almost on the fly. But it's really based on a little bit of experience on a similar situation and based on an understanding of what they're capable of. But they've had to adapt and improvise to a large degree. Um, but the, one of the things that I think is really crucially important is this, the C part, um, the, the scanning part of what we call the situation awareness. And I've built a, a model, but it's based on Michael Ensley's, uh, Ensley's uh, situation awareness model, which has its roots in aviation. Um, and that has a three-stage model. Uh, and I've, I've done something similar, where it's level one is observation, level two is realisation, level three is anticipation. And we get into also how players move around the field uh, I felt that was really important. So level one, it's I say it's the lowest, but again, these are all linked and they're nested with each other. So it's not like they're discrete and independent, but sometimes this is the best way to put it across. Um, but here, it's a, simply about gathering in information and players don't do this often enough. And panoramic positioning, getting yourself open to as much of the play as possible to maximise your field of view. Level two, the realisation, this is uh, where players start to put meaning to what they see. So often when we talk about decision-making, people start going into, well, players need to understand what's happening. Yes, they do. And I understand. But if they don't get their eyes away from the ball and onto other areas of the playing area, they can't inform themselves to make the decision. So we put the cart before the horse sometimes. But this is really important. They recognise partners and understand the tactical perspective of what's happening. They see the picture of what's going on. But again, adaptive positioning is important here. How they now position themselves in relation to what they see, their teammates, their opponents, the ball, the space that's around them. And then level three, anticipation, it builds on those first two levels. They're now able to go, this is how the play is likely to develop, right? Because they've got that understanding. That helps inform the decision-making process. And the uh, perspective positioning is they're readying themselves to, re to, to respond to what they think is going to unfold. You know, they've maybe loosened the relationships with these players here because they can see a switch of play coming, but they've not fully disengaged here because the play could stay here. But they're ready and on the front foot to respond to that. It's that those little actions and readying themselves. This is just a little cycle that I talk about um, where we go through from active scanning, just having a look, body position, both orientation and location on the field, Check again, which is one last look, even as the ball's on its way, which which is really important in soccer. The decision comes after that and a separate decision from the execution because you can have a great decision, but the execution isn't quite right. So we should evaluate it independently. Execution, like decision, independently evaluate it because you can have good execution, but a poor decision. And then follow on is... How quickly does the player re-engage with the game and 
look around and see where they are to know where they then need to be in response to the new situation and and unfolding situation. And it leads back into a active scanning. There's uh, been some great studies into to scanning how how this impacts on performance and Gears Your Debt has done some great work. Uh, he, this is from some of the work that he's done. And what he found was that the, he could separate players in the English Premier League midfielders in the English Premier League and look at how often they scanned, moved their head away from the ball. Those that scanned a lot completed 77% of their forward passes. Those that scanned the least only completed 39% of the forward passes. So a huge discrepancy in there. Um, yet there's a decision-making element in here, and we're not saying that scans everything, but you look at those that scan the most, they've informed their decision-making and been more successful. Those that have scanned the least, have they informed themselves enough to what their options are, to what they should be able to do? So they've given the ball away over six times out of ten, which is a huge amount for players playing in the English Premier League. And that's not to say that they are bad players, because they're great players, but it's it's or very good players at least. But it's as coaches, can we identify something that we could help them add to their game that they could be even better? Better. That there's been the measures. Xavi, a great Spanish player, had a fabulous career. He's right at the top of the tree. And this is like a, a top of the table league. Anything over 0.5 scans per second would be considered high. And that's in the measured in the last 10 seconds prior to receiving the ball. So the, these players would look five times in the 10 seconds prior to receiving the ball. They'd look away from the ball five times in that 10 seconds and anything over it and above that is considered high. Key moments for active scan, again, relate this to your own sport, but in soccer, it'd be as the ball is travelling when receiving a pass. So as late as possible, as early as needed. So can you, you know the ball's coming, you've assessed the flight as it's coming towards you. Can you have that one last look away? Best players in the world can even look away two or three times in that moment. And again, that depends on the distance and the pressure. Um, as the ball is travelling after playing the pass, so once I've played the pass, can I look to a key area to get more information of how do I need to move now to support the play as best as possible? As the ball is travelling between two players, this could be teammates or opponents. So as the ball is travelling over there between player A and B, that ball is moving. Nothing else is going to happen to that ball. There's an opportunity for me to scan somewhere else in the field of play that could be important for me to gather in information. And in between touches when a player is moving with the ball, again, teammates or opponents. So as they're moving with the ball and taking little touches at their feet, so this isn't dribbling, or it could be running to exploit space where there's big touches. Um, can the player use that? Again, myself, I could use that as the ball is between touches, a little look away to see what else has happened. But not as the ball is being touched. That's important. And as a player takes a control and touch, this is a more advanced technique for players that know their teammates, know what they tend to do, can read the play and understand this player is going to play two touch. They might, there may be another opportunity to fit in another scan just to update your picture as best you can. So there's some key moments, not an exhaustive list, but you'll find that covers the vast majority of moments in the game. More thoughts on how players scan to, to inform the decision-making process. Players must be able to scan left or right. It sounds simple, but they've got to be able to scan over both shoulders. So we've got to be able to train that effectively. So players are comfortable doing that on the field of play. Players must be also able to scan horizontally and vertically. So they must be able to scan across the field of play, and they must be able to scan up and down the field of play to be able to inform themselves. Players must be able to scan at the right time, which we have just touched on, those key moments. Scanning demands can also be position-specific. They can also be team-specific. And they can also be game-specific. So how you might need to apply your scanning could be different based on the position you play, the team you're playing for, and the game you play because of the opposition that you're up against. So it's important players have well-developed 360-degree scanning skills to inform the decision-making process. Arsene Wenger, one of the top uh, coaches in the world, now the technical director at, at FIFA, um, he did a gear job that went in Arsenal to do a big, huge season-long study, and he talks about this as a really crucial and important part of playing at the highest level. But it's important at any level of the game, and again, in any sport. 
any invasion type game sport. My big thing is that players develop as the environment demand, de demands development then. So as coaches, that's the decisions that they, they make in the games. Have they got the scanning skills to support that? And do we train it in the right way? And when we look at soccer and some of the uh, training formats that we use, we use compare. We use small-sided games, possession games, passing and receiving drills, and, and rondos. And this study was done in the Dutch League, and it showed that in games they needed to do 0.44 scans per second, but the training formats that we use had a marked drop-off in the amount of scanning that was demanded in those formats. So what I'm saying here is not that these formats are bad, because these are the tools that we have as coaches, but recognising that maybe we need to add in constraints that promote extra scanning that brings the players up to the level that's required in the game if we want to develop those behaviours and habits in the players to inform that decision-making process again in these fast-paced uh, sports. And uh, that's that's my uh, little presentation and chat and insight into the thoughts I've got on decision-making and how scanning is crucially important to inform that decision-making process. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, gosh, that was wonderful. <clears throat> and, and for sure, people who want to learn more about this application to fast-paced sports, uh, you'll be hearing more in the vendor section of Kevin's book. But uh, I do have one final question if we have time for it, uh, Kevin, mm -hmm. is how ha historically this idea of scanning has not been taught at, at youth right to the professional levels. How accepting our coaches that you're dealing with where you're trying trying to introduce this concept to them are, they, are the coaches and the players accepting of this notion well the players the players are what way you know again, again there's different levels of buying uh line but 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 I think we, we often think we are training it, but just putting them into these formats. So it's great that we've got studies out there that show actually our training formats maybe don't promote scanning as much as we think. So therefore, we, again, we just need to be aware of that. And then co how coaches choose to address it will be, be up to them. Um, but often my experience in the game is that the way it's been trained is the coach tells the player, remember, check your shoulder. And then they think that's enough. No, and I really don't think that's enough if we want to develop a behaviour, a, a positive behaviour and the habit that we want in the game. Um, and again, how early we can develop it, we try and develop it as young an age as possible. So it's just part of what they do as they move around the field and part of their receiving skills. And I don't think we, we ingrain that habit enough. Um, but coaches realise the importance, how they maybe then try to implement that and train that, that'll be up to them. Um, but I still feel it doesn't get quite addressed enough or we don't proactively coach it as much as we need to. Yeah, and you do have some wonderful drills in your in your excellent book. Uh, people can follow up on that. Thanks again. Thanks, Thanks for saying. Welcome everybody to our second speaker on our panel discussion on decision-making in fast-paced sports. You heard Kevin earlier, but now we have uh, Brett Strott, uh, speaking on, on decision-making in, in hockey. Uh, Brett comes to us. Uh, he tracked me down after reading my book and found out he, he is, uh, owns a, a couple of junior A teams in Tampa, Florida, just up the road from me. Uh, he played uh, collegiate hockey at the University of Minnesota and played professionally a bit, then went into coaching and now is a, uh, an owner but really is very much in love with the whole idea of uh, perceptual cognitive skills and training it in the, in the world of, of ice hockey. So we're hoping to kind of bring these concepts uh, to, to more people around the world. And uh, so uh, uh, Brett's our, our, our hockey guy today. Uh, at, the, at the end of his presentation, I'll have uh, Kevin give a, a little commentary and take his, get his views on this as well. So, uh, I'm going to turn things over to uh, to Brett now. So you're on, Brett. Hey, th thank you, Len. And also want to thank uh, the Sports Biometrics Conference for allowing both Kevin and I to, to share our concepts in regards to training game awareness and decision-making in fast-paced sports. So as coaches, we're always looking to elevate our players and, and ultimately our, our team's performances. But if we truly want to help players become the best versions of themselves, and take them from good to great, we really need to develop this mental talent uh, that we call the athlete's cognition. 
And so what is the formula to develop this athlete's cognition? Well, Tarasov, the great coach, you know, gives us some insight to his philosophy as he talks about that it's more than just building a strong culture and, and relying on our structure, but it's about developing the minds and becoming instinctive in our decisions and having a higher level of awareness and being able to analyze and, and eventually anticipate uh, future developments of the rink. And ironically, after reading uh, Kevin's book and, and Dr. Zakowski's book, uh, it ironically lines up with the virtually the same formula that both Kevin and Dr. Z describe in their books. Uh, Kevin's book, Scanning, How to Train It and Develop Game Awareness, or Dr. Z's book, The Playmaker's Advantage, they both talk about the athlete's cognition cycle. So the question remains, though, are, are players born with this special talent or can it be trained and developed? As we, we see the vision and decision making known as perceptual cognitive skills is what separates the, the elite from the average players. For me, for the past 25 years, I've always thought of just memorizing sensory experiences. What I mean by that, our entire life, our, our five senses are a super highway to our brain and, and we memorize these different experiences. You know, whether it's uh, placing a hand over a hot stove or our sense of feel remembers being burnt so it quickly instinctively pulls away or if we're on a train track or our sense of sound memorizes the sound of a train. We don't need to look right away. We, we jump off the tracks as our sense of sound activates the, the muscles in our legs and, and feet. And so, but a lot of times in, in, in sports, especially in team sports and especially in fast paced sports, we, we kind of suppress you know, that hockey sense or, or that, that field sense that, that, we're, that, that we're ultimately talking about. So, but before we can get into, you know, how we train it, we need to have a little understanding as coaches of, of the mental world. And, and it can be quite confusing, you know, talking to players when we start talking about the brain and the mind and the subconsciousness or the conscious and then get into visualization and, and et cetera. It, it gets kind of confusing for players. And so one of the best ways to simplify it is to think of our brain as a computer. And in fact, uh, the brain is the best computer ever built. And like a computer, it does come pre-wired or hardwired. You know, it pumps our blood and digests our food, things we don't need to think about. But as we start living our lives, it, we, be, we begin to download new software, new apps, uh, so to speak. And on the other hand, our, our mind, on the other hand, it just simply displays the software that we download. Just like a computer, we have to download Microsoft PowerPoint to, to play this uh this uh, exercise or this uh, presentation on, on a video. And that's what we're doing our entire life is we're just downloading these different connections and then we create a neural network by integrating these different connections, uh, just like a computer. And so like our computers though, we need to update or add new, new software. Again, we talk a lot about having an elite mindset just because we react a certain way or get a negative attitude toward, towards a, a coach doesn't mean it's the, the best way. And we, so we can update these things. But for today, we're talking about the perceptual skill of awareness. And we need to make these new connections so they can integrate within one another to create a neural network. And so over the years, I've, I've come up with uh, 12 connections that I use to form the foundation of developing the perceptual uh, skill of awareness. And we're going to go through these here. As Kevin talks about in his book, he breaks down the skill of awareness as level one being the observation or Dr. Z talks about scanning. A, a big part of observation and scanning is really understanding how to set our eyes in what we call peripheral vision mode. We all know what peripheral vision is, but we don't recognize sometimes in games, especially when defenders uh, come at us with speed, our eyes will tend to go into that yellow cone, what we call straight line vision. And when that happens, that's all we see. So a lot of times on the ice, uh, we see that um, as coaches, that players are wide open to the left or to the right of them, just within their peripheral vision, but because a lot of times their eyes go in that straight line vision. So we need to know how to set our peripheral vision. And when you do set your eyes in peripheral vision, things become a little bit out of focus. We don't need to see the details of, of each player. We just need to be able to see you know, maybe uh, the, the knees and, and, and socks of, 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 of certain colors of, of certain players. And as we learn how to, again, develop the, uh, the, the connection of looking beyond defenders, because a lot of times, again, our sense of sight goes right to the defender, and that's all we see, but we got to look beyond, or we got to, like we said, look for colors. And another thing is also getting the big picture, and we're going to show here shortly with Nikita Kucherov and some of the greats. They're always getting the big picture and positioning their nose 
so they, they can see everything. A lot of players will look right at the puck and then half their peripheral vision is, is in the stands or out, outside the zone. And then we can, then the, the next level of awareness is uh, the, of the, the skill of, of realization. And again, in hockey, we got to see what the puck sees. A lot of times what our eyes are seeing, it's totally different than what the puck sees. You can see here Nikita Kucherov, what his eyes are seeing compared to what his puck is seeing. It's two different things. And we can train our brain to pull in this information and use our imagination to actually see what, what the, the puck is seeing. Another thing we call is others' perspective. You just can't see what you're seeing, but you've got to be able to tell uh, what your teammates are, are seeing. And also to be able to uh, see those seams and open spaces, but also... Great players play by feel. We can learn how to feel the spatial relations, not just between our, our teammates, but more importantly, between us and the defenders. And by doing this, it, again, it continues to free up our sense of sight. And as we continue to make the connections of not just using our sense of sight, but also our sense of feel and sense of sound, I believe the great players use all five of their senses. And I believe they separate their senses. They separate what they're able to see and what they're able to feel and what they're, they're, they're able to, to hear. And, and as they pull all this information, use their five senses, they allow their imagination to fill in the blanks. Uh, the great goal scorers, they don't need to see the entire net. Ovechkin doesn't need to see it. Uh, the corner of the eye, he sees where the lower left post is. The net's four by six. It hasn't changed in 100 years. And so you're, let your imagination fill in those blanks to know exactly uh, where the upper right or the upper left or the, or the other corners are. And then as we continue to, to do this and make these connections, we begin to now be able to see the game and develop the vision like, like the, the greats of our time. And this leads us to the, the third level of skill of awareness uh, as Kevin talks about in his book, there's a skill of anticipation. And again, this can be built upon the, the other two, allowing players to be one step ahead of the play and by correctly guessing opponents uh, intentionally in, in their movements. And this is what we see, see as greatness in all these players. So I want to move on to a couple of videos here to kind of show what we're talking about here. So the, the first one is Nikita Kucherov and applying these perceptional cognitive skills along with some sample practice drills designed to make new connections that will form this neural network of perceptional cognitive skills. And the second video uh, shows the process of the U.S. Women's National Team. So in this first one here, if we can back up a second. So you can see, you can see where his nose is facing and this thus allows his peripheral vision to see the, the, the whole ice in that zone. And then as the puck is coming, he sees what the, the, the puck's perspective, not his perspective, but also sees others' perspective, knows what handed players are, he instinctively makes these plays. We'll see a couple more here. Look where his, his nose is facing, kind of more in the middle. Allows him to, to see everything. If he was facing straight with the puck here, he wouldn't be able to see the players on the right. And again, he's just pulling information in. We're not looking for things. We're just pulling information in can see his puck's perspective, sees the other's perspective, look at the knees and skates, knows the direction of Braden Point, knows that he's right-handed and puts it right on the tape in the right spot. Again, you can see here as he gets the puck in the slot, watching it adjust his head just to get the proper view to see not only what his puck sees, but also what others see. So he's always aware of his situation as well as others and what handed players there are makes these spontaneous right decisions. Again, whether it's catching pass, making plays, or as he's skating down again, by looking in the middle of where his where he could shoot or where he could pass, allows him to pull in all this information, always seeing the puck's perspective. You can see here again in detail where his nose is facing. So we've got to be able to make and catch passes using our peripheral vision. And most players want to adjust their head and use their straight line of vision to do this. Now, this one here is more about feel. Great players feel the defenders coming in. It allows them to free up their sense of sight and make adjustments. We're seeing from a different angle here. So we can teach players how to feel the space between themselves and defenders. That keeps closing in on them. And when you get a stick length away, you can see them adjust the stick to change the angle. Makes it look very easy as he passes underneath the stick. Again, knows the player coming down with him is left-handed, tries to put it on the forehand every time. Again, that puck's perspective in traffic. We saw earlier, he's one of the best at it. This is a skill that can be trained by using your imagination. 
This puck sees the wide open net on the left side. His eyes may see something else on the right. What else he does, I call it the, the vertex, the, the, the spot, the angle where catching a pass and making an X pass, in this case shooting. Nikita's one of the best that adjusted his body so his stick's in that perfect spot to give him the, the most open net to shoot from. Most players won't adjust that much, and it just being a little bit uh, not in the right spot can make the difference from scoring a goal or the goalie saving it. Watch here how, how far his stick blade travels because he's always seeing what his stick blade is seeing. Travels from there to there, gives him a wide open net. And again, you can see how precise we can become at this. There'd be a spot, maybe just three inches wide, just enough for a puck to fit through, but he has to be in that exact spot to be able to score the goal. It's a difference between scoring and not scoring. In those situations, are threading the needle to a, to a player. So a couple of drills here. This is a, a drill we worked a lot with the women's national team. This is one of my junior teams. Again, just making a triangle, but position your nose in between the two other players and holding your nose in that situation. So it forces you to use your peripheral vision. You may lose sight of the puck at times. We just got to use your imagination based on the direction the puck's coming and know where your stick blade is. And so in other drills, once we learn how to use our peripheral vision, just look for knee, knees and skates. That's all they're looking for where the other players' knees and skates are to skate away, to not run into each other. In this drill, we're keeping the puck on the forehand, make it a little more difficult. Then we can add just five guys and then eventually add defenders in there, but they're just tracking knees and skates and movement, knowing what hand everybody is. I'm not saying you can't pass the backhand, but at any time we can pass the forehand. This, is, this player's got his eyes closed. He's feeling the space expanding, from this case, the goal line. And then he's feeling it contracting. And then once he feels that he's at the starting point, he opens his eyes. So... Watch him again as he goes much farther back. The entire time, his eyes are completely shut. He's feeling that space expanding, feeling it contracting right on the money. And so how we do it in a game, you got to, with your eyes open now, we've got to just use our sense of feel. Every sense has a different sensation. We're feeling the space expand and contraction. And in the game, we don't need to look at the defender. We look beyond him. But our sense of feel tells us, hey, it's time to skate away or move, or move that puck. So this next video is uh, the women's national team as they're preparing for the 2018 Olympics. Oop. And again, we lost in 2014 and then uh, in the first tournament uh, after the Olympics. And so we decided to start adding these uh, perceptual cognitive skills into our game. And we're actually implementing right here at, at the 2015 World Championships. Uh, we're not together as a team in a year round like it would be with, with most team sports. We just get together for a couple weeks at a time during the season, maybe a week before the world. So right during the World Championships, we're practicing these different perceptual cognitive skills. And again, there's going to be mistakes made. Like you see here, we're still forcing things. We're not quite aware. But as coaches, we've got to allow for these mis mistakes to happen as long as they're applying these things. And you can see in a very short time, this is really only two, three weeks of training now, that they're much more aware where everyone is at all times, feeling the space between them and defenders, and that the feeling tells them to move the puck back or peel back, know what handed players are. Big difference in our puck possession game. So again, you can see the progress being made in, in a very short time. There's just a, a few weeks. Not only applying these in practice, but more importantly, visualizing them and mental rehearsing them. But now we got to do it against our, our rival Canada. They're just as fast as us and as strong. And so now we really got to be quick. So we're, we're much quicker at making our decisions, much more aware. Again, still a little bit off, but it's the right idea, right intentions.
This is one of our most defensive defensemen on the team. Having that awareness where players are as he's rushing the puck. Again, feeling the space between the defenders closing down. It's the feeling that's moving their body, not their sense of sight anymore. Again, you can see most passes are on the forehand when possible. So this isn't meant to impress anybody, but it's to impress upon you the impact these concepts can have on both the individual and player uh, and the team as these perceptual cognitive skills played a major role in us winning seven straight tournaments, you know, including the gold medal in 2000, 2018. So no question, great players, the difference between them is they have the ability to play creatively within the team structure because they're wired differently, but hopefully today's presentation can help shed some light on ways to elevate game awareness and decision making, allowing more players to experience the playmaker's advantage. Well, thanks, Brett. I'm really grateful for the superb presentation uh, in, in the world of ice hockey. Uh, I'm just going to ask uh, Kevin to. Yeah, since he's watched this and kind of take off from his earlier paper, um, some some thoughts he may have on Brett's presentation. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Great presentation, Brett. And I think um, really reinforced it to me. What really came through was much as we're, we're talking about decision making, what we've really reinforced, uh, I think, over both presentations is the part that needs to get played that informs the decision-making process. You know, the, the scanning, the awareness that um, I've talked about it in my way. I thought uh, Brett made a great point. Uh, I talk about body position, you know, orientation and location on the field. And Brett's mentioned about, you know, even get, getting your head position right so you can maximise your field of view for the purpose of using your peripheral vision and working with the players on that so they can get the information in the need that, that they need in order to make the best decisions possible. I think often coaches, again, I mentioned it in mine, they start saying about, oh, well, players need to understand this and then they need to decide that. And it's all great because a lot of the time, if you ask players the answers, uh, the questions, they know the answers. But the problem is when they're on the field or they're on the ice, they don't use their eyes well enough to get information in to inform the decision making process so they can get the decision right in the moment if that makes sense yeah thanks thanks so much uh, for that uh, your, your thoughts on that kevin uh i'm sh sure our audience is going to have a number of questions uh and and uh, they'll be able to um get into the chat room and, and pose them, but they also have contact, uh, my contact information, Brett's and Kevin's contact information. So if you want more, more info, please feel free to contact us. Thanks so much for yep. coming to our session. It's been great. Thanks, Brett. Thank Thanks, Len. Yep, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Len.